prayer. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, well, it's a great joy for me to be here with you uh, for a number of reasons. One, because I've been now assigned to this diocese and to actually be able to participate. It's my first time doing this uh, here with you all and also to be able to share with you uh, the fruit of my life's research is what I can say. You've heard that I've been teaching for many, many years. I keep trying to retire. Never works, never works. <laughs> so what I've done um, is to put together this outline of the way I'm going to approach the subject with a chart of philosophers and what kind of theory they have about the relationship of woman and man. And I want to really just share with you what I discovered. I started 40 years ago, you know, as a young professor up in Montreal thinking, what can I publish? What can I write about? And I noticed that in looking at the history of philosophy, hardly anything was written about woman and woman in relation to man. And I thought, well, this looks like it'd be an interesting area. Nobody was really doing much with it then. They were just starting to think about it at that time, the early 70s. And so what I decided to do was to start with the pre-Socratics. And you'll see I have in the chart the historical period, the ancient medieval roots. And um, then I went on to look to see, well, what is the concept of woman? How does it describe? So if you look at page two of the um, outline where there are charts, you'll see there are structure of the question about man and woman's identity. And what I discovered is as soon, they were mostly men philosophers all in that early period. As soon as a man started to think about his own identity, he was thinking also about woman's identity. And they had fragments of answers. And if you look at that, there's four categories that they thought about. Opposites are male and female the same, polar opposites or complements. It's questions. They had different answers. In generation or philosophy of science, how does the contribution to generation relate to sex and gender idea, identity of mother or father? That's the second area. The third is wisdom, or what we call epistemology now, theory of knowledge. Do men and women have the same faculties of intellect? Are they wise by knowing the same or different things? And then the fourth area is ethics or virtue. Do women and men have the same capacity for virtue, and are they good in the same or different ways? So all the things that they said, I was able to put in those categories. And then underneath it, there were several questions. And what I discovered is, this is really interesting. Nobody's looked at this, and nor have they looked at the relationship between the philosophers. And uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about the relation between theology and philosophy. But generally speaking, philosophy uses observation of the senses and reason as its methodology, whereas theology uses faith and the authority of the scriptures, revelation, as, as their methodology. Ultimately, it, they should come to the same conclusions because there's only one truth. But as you'll see, <laughs> there are long, long gaps when that doesn't quite happen okay, in the history of philosophy. So that's the first thing to, is that I discovered, was that the concept of woman has a structure. I was a math major before I became a philosophy major, so I was thinking of a bracket, you know, where you have parts in the bracket. And so I used that structure when I went to look at all the philosophers in the history of philosophy that had talked about women. And so the first people that I found were the Platonists, Plato and his philosophers who actually began to propose a theory. And their theory, we'll come into a little more discussion of it later, but basically it's the founder of the unisex theory. Plato argued that there are no significant differences between men and women, male and female, and for that reason they're equal. He believed in reincarnation, so he thought that a soul was sexless, unisex, had no sex, it could be reincarnated in a female or a male body. Or animals, birds, whatever, different kinds. 
But that was the first theory, unisex theory articulated that long ago, 428 to 355 BC. Aristotle was Plato's student. He disagreed with Plato. He said, no, we have only one life. And Aristotle is, was a genius in science in terms of believing that we should use empirical investigation to find out the truths of things. So his methods are still used in many sciences and fields today. At the same time, though, he made a colossal mistake when it came to male and female, which I'll just very briefly tell you. He, he didn't know that the female ovulated. He thought only the male had fertile seed and that the female provided passive matter for the male seed, a bit like yeast being set. So the male seed could set the matter, female matter, and he said if it was a perfect setting, it would become, the child would be a male that looked like the father. If it was a little bit off, it would be a male that looked like the mother or a female that looked like the father. If it was more off, it would be a female that looked like the mother or there would be no conception. I mean, it sounds hilarious to us, but he was the first one to do, articulate this. And so he argued then that the male was by nature superior to the female because in all four of those categories, it turned out that the, the male was the, the superior opposite to the female in metaphysics, in generation, in wisdom. He argued that the female then generated, achieved its fullness less quickly. And so the woman's virtue was to have true opinion, whereas the man's was to have true reasoning through syllogisms. And then in terms of virtue and ethics, the, the same thing, the male by nature should rule because the female was less capable of it and the female by nature should obey and that the female should be only active in the private sphere and the male in the public. So this is Aristotle's theory, very briefly stated. I mean, I love Aristotle and it turns out his, his philosophy of the person as a composite of soul and body is correct, but this other part is wrong. So philosophy is full of errors all the time. You have to be prepared for that. But it's self-correcting over time. And fortunately today, all those errors have been corrected. We know today how conception occurs, that the male and female provide equal, equal you know, com contributions to it. Neither is superior, although are there are some radical feminists who argue females are superior because they have more estrogen and there are others who may argue males are superior because they have more testosterone. But you know, when you get into all those small changes, it's just different ways of looking at the same thing. So what I discovered then from the beginning was that there was this conflict between the Platonic and the Aristotelian view of woman and man's identity and of their relationship. This went on until Christianity, until Jesus Christ entered into the world and then we began to get Christian uh, theologians and philosophers writing about the topic. So St. Augustine is the first one who basically reflected in the city of God on the fact that if Aristotle is right and the females are by nature um, inferior, then in the, when we have the resurrection of the body, what does that mean? Some, he says, some people say women will be turned into men in heaven because all our imperfections are removed. <laughs> you can see it's the logic from the Aristotelian view 800 years before. I'm really giving you a quick summary here. Uh, it's, it's the logical conclusion, but he said, for my part, I don't see woman's identity as having any imperfection. It's just her nature. It's not a defect. And so from my point of view, Augustine said, in heaven, there will be both males and females, you know, in the dignity and the fullness of their sex. But meanwhile, Augustine didn't carry this all the way through his thought about on earth. After the fall, that's the way it happened, that the female then had to be held in check by the male. So he, I won't go into the details in his theory, but just to give you an idea, there was a struggle within Augustine and others about marriage, for example. So he argued that in marriage, the, 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 together they make one unit, and that is the unit that's in the image of God. 
the female by herself was not in the image of God. Unfortunately, he did say that. <laughs> but together, the husband and wife are. But the husband is by himself in the image of God. So you begin to see the sex polarity creeping in again. And what it took was really centuries for it to, to work itself out correctly. Now, um, what happened after uh, Augustine is we have Hildegard of Bingen, a great saint, a, Dominic, a Benedictine saint. She then tried to correct Aristotle's view in all four of those categories. Now, she was using medieval humors and um, elements in her science. It's not contemporary science, but you can read, when you read her carefully, you can see that she tried in every area to bring the balance back, Hildegard did. So I call her the foundress of sex complementarity. She's the first to try to do it systematically across all four categories. So um, now that's in just before the highest medieval stage. You know, so Hildegard and St. Anselm also had some understanding of complementarity. And uh, then we have, unfortunately, the, the coming into Europe of all the Aristotelian texts from Greece when they were invaded and they all settled into um, northern Italy, the, the scholars. And so before that, they were, the, their texts, all of Aristotle's texts were integrated into the University of Paris. And so we begin to, well, well Hildegard's was beginning to catch on and getting some momentum. And she had the, the professors at Paris look at her work. In the long run, it got overcome by the Aristotelian corpus because Aristotle was so right on so many things. It's just in this one area, there was a big error, that error, question of ovulation that he didn't recognize. So then we have this whole period of where we had again strong polarity. We have some Neoplatonists who come in to the picture and begin to bring Plato alive in Renaissance, Catholic Renaissance. So you start to get all kinds of study groups going on in Italy, Germany, France, with, where you have uh, wealthy patrons outside the academic world. And so there you begin to get the, the liveliness of the complementarity coming out because there were women and men together in those study groups. Whereas in the universities, women were excluded. The universities were set up specifically for the purpose of educating the clerics, the priests. So it, it wasn't done intentionally to exclude women in my point of view, but it, it had that effect. So women had to find another way and another place to get educated. So it happened in small study groups in Europe, in England, and um, it took a long time, really until the 20th century, until you got another momentum for uh, integral complementarity. And I'll tell you more about, I'm jumping way ahead here, but I just want you to, to you can look at the outline of the people there, and you can see that in the 20th century, um, after Edith Stein, Edith Stein herself really began to do a great deal of work in complementary. She didn't use the word, but she did the work in it. But what we have happening is the, it, with Dietrich von Hildebrand, Gabriel Marcel, Jacques Maritain, Raisa Maritain, Emmanuel Mounier, Bernard Lonergan, Carol, Carl Wojtyla, John Paul II, there are others, Balthazar, there are many others. There was an extraordinarily re renewal that occurred in Catholic thought. Many of these were converts to Catholicism. They knew each other. There was a study group that went on in France, Moudon, between the two world wars. They all came. I was going to read you a little picture, a description of this study group. It's uh, got it here. It, it was started by Jacques and Raisa Maritain in their home in mood down. And um, it was an extraordinary, oh, maybe I'm not gonna find it, I'm <laughs> sorry. I, I had it out here earlier. Here we go. Sorry. Uh, never mind. <laughs> sorry, I'm gonna just leave it here. 
Anyway, I, I can't find it. Too many pages here. But the, the study group had in it not just Catholics, but Jewish people. It had um, Eastern European uh, Christians. It had um, many Protestants, too. They were all invited to come if they were interested in looking at how St. Thomas's philosophy could be renewed in a way that could uh, do two things. Accept the sort of new discoveries in science, because um, St. Thomas and Aristotle were sort of locked into erroneous science. So it was open to what was happening in the 20th century in science. That's the first thing. The second thing, they wanted it to have an impact in ethics and politics. How you could use St. Thomas, that it could be not just locked up into manuals and universities, but really be involved with people in the world. So that renewal is what really finally broke open the possibility of getting uh, an integral complementarity with a solid foundation. So what happened, this we can go now look at this description on the outline of the history of the word complementarity. We have to make a distinction between the word and the concept because the concept of complementarity was starting out in, with Augustine early on in little parts, Hildegard, but the word wasn't used. The first time I found the word used was in 1927 when Niels Bohr was trying to describe the wave and particle theory of light in physics. And it had to do with the relation of classical science, which was the wave theory, and quantum science, which was particle theory. And light was measured or explained by those two different ways. And what Bohr said is in order to understand light, you have to be able to see that both of these, you have to understand it, how it works as a wave and how it works as a particle. So that was the first, and he used the word complementarity for it, the complementarity theory. And he had just won the Nobel Prize in physics before that. So the word finally was out there. And then Dietrich von Hildebrand, who was a phenomenologist who studied the whole experience of consciousness with Husserl, I don't want to throw too many names out here, but just if those of you that know about those people, it's a different way of doing philosophy, looking at the experience that one has of something and trying to find the universal elements. Well, he right away, two years later, he said that there is a metaphysical complementarity of a woman and man in marriage. It's the first time I ever saw it applied to women and men. Niels Bohr applied it to other people, other kind of situations, but not to marriage and not to male, female. So von Hildebrand, in a way, understood if you want to understand the human person, you have to understand how woman's a human person and how man is a human person. You have to understand both in order to understand the human person. Those are the first two principles of complementarity, significant difference and equal dignity. The third principle is synergetic relation meaning that when they are in union, something more happens. It's like one plus one leads to three, okay? Something happens. I mean, if they're fertile and it could be biological generation, but it can also be something which John Paul II really developed, which is the synergetic union of communion of persons. That's where it comes in the end. It comes to really understanding the Holy Trinity. That's why I started with that prayer. The Holy Trinity, is one being with three divine persons, but it's synergetic. There's something more that always happens in their relation with each other, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's generative spiritually, and also it created the world. So that's the model that John Paul II takes for complementarity, and we'll come back to him in some depth later on. But just sort of working your way quickly through the history of philosophy, you can see how these things started to emerge in fragments in, in, or in somewhat erroneous ways, somewhat positive ways. So then the next interesting thing that happened is Bernard Lonergan reviewed a copy of this book on marriage that Dietrich von Hildebrand had written when it was translated into English. And he wrote a review for it in the, in the Catholic newspaper in Montreal, which is where I was living. So, I mean, it was just amazing to see that three. And so it's the first time I saw that. So he then 
Bernard Lonergan, if you know about him, he's a Jesuit. He's no longer alive, but he loved science. And he saw his whole purpose of being a Thomist is how to integrate <coughs> science and into Thomism. And one of the things they had to do was to open up the meaning of form. People, everybody know what form means? No. Yes? It, it, the Catholic position in St. Thomas is that anything that is has a form and matter. Together, it's one composite. And if it's a living thing, the form is the soul that organizes the matter. Okay. But what they also thought in the, was that the form was always immaterial. It had no matter to it. Now, in modern science, you have all kinds of descriptions of structures for living things. You know, you have molecules, you have hydrogen atoms. In the human body, we have hydrogen atoms, we have fluid, H2O, then we have um, systems that or organize those fluids. So you have the cardiology, cardiac, what do you say? How do you say the heart system anyway? Then you have also um, that whole system is organized by the body itself as a whole. So every system is organized by a higher system. If you're baptized and you receive the Eucharist, you're organized, you're adopted into the body of Christ. But with a difference, human beings have free will. It's not like our hydrogen atoms that have no free will when they're organized into H2O or fluids in the body. So what Lonergan did he is to write, uh, develop a theory of what he calls um, the forms that are nested inside each other. And the forms are nested there, they're conjugate forms, he calls them, in the body. And then the central form, which is your soul, organizes the whole thing. So, for example, when I came up here, I moved my whole body right up here with all those systems going in, working. So with my free will, my intellect, as a human being, I do this. But if I'm baptized, brought into the body of Christ, then this is a spiritual level of being organized into a spiritual reality. So what Lonergan did, which was so brilliant, is to show how all those Thomistic concepts of form and matter can be opened up without losing the main idea of what they are. They're opened up so that they can now breathe with the true science of the contemporary world. OK, so that's what Lonergan did. Now, Jacques Maritain and Raisa, as I mentioned, when they became Catholic, they started these study groups. And he was mostly interested with the other personalists in politics. It was between the two world wars in France. They were very interested in how to get Catholic action going in France. And so they were only looking at how you apply the principles of natural law, just war, all those things that were very good in St. Thomas, that, that are correct, that there's nothing wrong with it at all, how to apply them practically. And then after Raisa Maritain died, Jacques Maritain was very close to the little brothers in France. And he gave a talk in 1975 to the little brothers about how you can go back and find complementarity in Genesis. And he used the word complementarity then. And he started to elaborate how Eve and Adam were complementary to one another in Genesis. Now, if you look down to the next part, history of the concept complementarity, I have there the essential components of complementarity as they are found in scripture, which is way before philosophy got started at all, but it's revelation. So what we can say is the book of Genesis reveals four principles of human complementarity. The principle of equal dignity of all human beings is revealed in Genesis 1.26. Let us make the hum man, the human being, in our image after our likeness. So all human beings are equally made in the likeness of God. But the significant difference between woman and man is revealed in Genesis 1.27. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then the third principle, the synergetic relation of a woman and a man, is revealed in Genesis 1.28. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And in Genesis 2.24, they became one flesh. 
Now, a fourth principle of human complementarity is what I call intergenerational fruition. It's the only kind that goes from one generation to the next. And in Genesis, you find it in book 5, 1 through 32. This is the book of generations, and in the subsequent listing of all those who generated one generation after another, from Adam to Noah. And that list of generations is actually how people recorded time in those early days. And it only happens when you have males and females in a synergetic relation, that you get one generation after another. It's the only way it happens. So um, it makes it possible for actually Jesus Christ to come to earth in order to save us. So it's a very important part of our faith. Now, one of the questions you may ask, and we'll have quite a lot of time to talk about things, is what is the relationship between the word gender and sex? Okay, This is my view. If you look at the word, the root of generation, it's G-E-N, gen. That means to breed. It's the meaning of the word. So it's, in a way, our word, right from Genesis, the book of Genesis, because the word of the generation and this theory of generations is right there. It's also in philosophy there in Aristotle's book on the generation of animals, which had many, many good things in it, even though he had this one serious error. So the word gen was there in ancient Greek philosophy. It's there in scripture. Uh, the root, in, at least translated in English, but it's also there if you look in other languages, the meaning of it. It means to reproduce, to breed. So this is why we use the word gens for different relations, cousins, and so on. That root, wherever you engender. Okay, there are many ways it's there. It always has that root meaning. So in my view, what I would say is uh, you would, the word sex, if you look at this box, historical development of dimensions of integral gender complementarity. The first level of the way people talked about man and woman was by talking about female and male. So that's sex, and the word sex was used. So sex is there, and it's like a one-point dimension. I was a math major, as I said, so I'm always thinking in geometries and things like that. So you have that one point is uh, the female-male sex difference. Now, we know today that involves chromosomes, it involves uh, anatomy and physiology, generally speaking. That's what sex is. Now, Aristotle also very wisely said, science is about what is always or for the most part true. There are always exceptions, he says. There's always exceptions. So nature is never like mathematics. It's important to know there always are. And when human beings experience that in their own body, it's a very painful reality. It's a huge suffering. So the exceptions are there, there's no doubt. But the exceptions do not destroy the rule. It doesn't mean you should get rid of sex altogether. And I'll talk more about that later, which is what some people are saying. We should have 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 35, 40 sexes, whatever you want, combining whatever fragment of the person you want and what kind of sex activity you want. I, my view is no. We say the truth, which is that the human being is always or for the most part male or female. That's, that's just a philosophical statement. Now, what you had happening in the 15th century, starting with the Renaissance, is you start to get the word feminine and masculine introduced into language, discussing women and man's identity. So, and with the sense that you could have, um, well, for example, Petrarch talks about a masculine woman who can weigh, lift more weights than man can, okay? And Teresa of Avila says, be manly sisters, all right? She uses those words, be strong. I mean, that's how they use the words. So you get an idea that a woman could have a masculine characteristic, or if positive or negative. And the same thing for St. John of the Cross, described himself as spiritually the bride of Christ, great mystic. So they were beginning to become aware there's more to us than just sex identity. 
There's something, and that's where, in my view, the gender identity starts to open up in the history of philosophy. You start to see that there are characteristics about people that go beyond just simple sex. Now, it doesn't, until we get to the 19th century, that's, so that's like a two-dimensional, a triangle, where you have female, masculine, and feminine, male, masculine, and feminine. That that's represents that stage in the history of philosophy. The next one is 19th century, when you start to get existentialists like Nietzsche and Kierkegaard and all these other, Freud even, psychologists saying, you can become the kind of woman you want to be or the kind of man you want to be. So that's where the will comes in and the intellect. Well, I want to be like my mother or my grandmother or my aunt. I don't want to be like that person. So you start to define yourself as a kind of woman or man you want to be. Okay, so that's, that's where you get three-dimensional understanding of sex identity. Now, the word gender itself did not get started to be used until the 20th century, interestingly enough. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about the concept without the word. Okay, so the word, when, when did the word get going? When that started to happen was, uh, it began in a hypothetical way in anthropology. I had decided I have to look outside philosophy because I couldn't find any place in philosophy that the word gender came in. I thought, where did it come from? The first place I discovered it was in the anthropologist Margaret Mead's work in one text where she just said, what if there were 13 genders? She was talking about being in another culture and trying to understand people. She said, how would we understand this? She just asked it as a question. But then what happened is we have the beginning of virulent sex ideology and gender ideology. And I'll just tell you about them. Sex ideology began with Kinsey. I don't know if you know about Kinsey. In my, my generation, we all do. Um, he was an entomologist who studied insects. But he had a theory that he wanted to look at the, what he called the normal sex activity, first of the human male and then of the human female. And what he did was put together massive numbers of interviews. You know, he said there were like 20,000. It turned out there were about 7,000, but it's still massive. And he put his groups together for the males it involved all kinds of examples of males, you know, um, you, any, anyone you can think of. But he saw the sex as related to just an outlet of an activity. There was no interest in who or what the person was having sex with. This has all come out now in a very critical review of his work, where people were looking at his methodology. The same thing for the sex in the human female. He put together prostitutes with married women, everybody in these groups, and just said they were all normal. And so what he did is quantify the number of sexual outlets they had. Well, these books became best sellers, New York Times, Time Magazine. In the beginning, people thought it was true until they only later realized the harm. He had a position in a university in the United States, and they had all kinds of experimentation going on, even with children and babies. I mean, things that have come out now, which would be just straight, they'd be in jail for. So anyway, that's how the sex ideology got started. Then the gender ideology followed soon behind it. This was a um, man named Hen uh, Money, Dr. Money, who came from uh, New Zealand to Harvard to do a doctorate on hermaphrodites. And he finished it and then was hired by Johns Hopkins for people that were having difficulty with their identity. And you know, there are people that are born where there are, you know, things are not properly fully developed and the question of what to do about it. So it had, the, the people had the intention of doing something good to help the person. But the difficulty was that Dr. Money was driven to prove that he was going to, he could turn anybody into anything. And he decided there was what he called a gender window between the year of birth and two. 
of anyone and that they could be treated with hormones and you know, surgery and become either male or female. And of course, he was criticized by this, by other you know, good scientists. And then this couple who had had um, a, identical twins born to them in Canada um, came to see him. They'd heard he could help them. And um, he recommended, what the, the difficulty was that one of, there was a circumcision and one of the young, the, one of the babies lost the penis. So he said, let's turn that one into a girl. And so he experimented on this poor kid and um, for years, I mean, they had to keep coming back. And he said, don't, for the parents, don't you ever tell that person that they were born as a boy. Never tell them. So you can see the deception in the, in the ex particular experiment. There's, these are also now well documented. So it turned out that um, he hated this boy that was turned into a girl, hated the situation, never adjusted well. So finally a psychiatrist told the family, you have to tell them the truth. They were 15 by now. And um, so as soon as that happened, this one wanted to be turned back to what he was normally. It was such a tragic situation. I mean, both of the brothers committed suicide eventually. So I don't want to go into all the details, but the trouble was their theories were already out there and acclaimed in these magazines and newspapers, New York Times, Time Magazine. And there were a lot of feminists that at that time were quite interested in this theory that it does, you know, you're born, you can become whatever. And so they adopted the conclusions and put them in their textbooks. I have that all well documented and thing. Which books, you know, in his, they thought it was right. So the difficulty was that it wasn't right. And, and it's like all di ideologies. It harms the innocent and it ignores the facts. So this then infiltrated back into philosophy. In France, Foucault is one example in France. There are all sorts of other people that accepted the other part as true, that, that our, our identity as ma male or female is variable. You know, it could be changed by drugs, by upbringing, everything. So that particular sex gender ideology has, in my view, seriously infected the thinking of normal people. And um, what happened was, and this is all very traceable, the, this theory of the gender window and all of that then got adopted through the feminist. I mean, they were meaning well, I think, I presume that, but at the UN. And the UN then started to use, try to use that as an important right. And so all these women's conferences, they were, trying to get it through the UN that everybody has a right to whatever they want in terms of that. And so uh, what finally happened was that some Catholics who were working at, like Marianne Glendon, I don't know if you know her, but she was the head of the Vatican um, group that was in Beijing, the Women's Conference, and John Paul II, they saw what was happening. And so they really fought hard along with uh, Muslim countries and others too that wanted to keep nature the way it seems to be normally um, to not allow that to get into the UN at rights and uh, so to keep gender they won the argument to keep gender just in its normal meaning which then was fine but what's happening is the normal meaning is getting pushed out in all the directions so uh, to try to change the normal meaning to be 10, 15, whatever kind of genders. And that's what we see in our culture happening a lot. So uh, with that is just a kind of an introduction. I think uh, in my view, I'll just conclude because I want to have time for us to talk together. I think we, we have to, as Catholics, really be, or Christians, be very clear on what we think is true and just state it simply and and you know that's the greatest thing we can do to what i call ransom the word back from where it's been going it's just by using the word in its normal way as it is so far still um, and see what then will happen i think we shouldn't be intimidated by people there's a lot of er philosophical errors in their positions which again i won't bore you with too much but 
if you read them carefully, you can see they, first of all, make the exception the rule. They try to define the person by fragments. For example, their arguments are, well, if there's six genders, you have them all related to the gonad gonadal gender, the this gender, the that gender, the next. You know, they break the person down into parts. There's no understanding of the person as a soul body unity. They're fragmented parts. They've also done all kinds of other erroneous um, arguments. And anyone that's interested in the philosophy of it, I do have them in my work. Um, and so you can read them there. I, I, so what I think I'll just do and just tell you one last thing when I have this section on the union of the word and the concept of complementarity. This is something that in the books I have that I worked hard to try to prove that complementarity is not just a preferred theory. It's not just one I think I like better than the others. But I've used Newman's criteria for the true development of a living idea, which he developed in his essay on the development of Christian doctrine. When he was trying to decide whether to become Catholic, he said, I have to find some criteria to see which churches today I believe is the true development of the church founded by Jesus Christ. This is theological. So I'm a philosopher, so I said, well, let's see if this works for the basic, the two original ideas for complementarity. And I did it, I do it, and it does work. So, but it's a, you have to read it and see, it's a long working through. But the first living idea is the one that the metaphysical foundation for an individual person as a soul, body, form, matter, composite, man or woman. That you have to have. If you go into a dualism like Descartes or Plato's, it, you can never keep the unity of the human person. And it's, it's compatible with the dogma, the resurrection of the body, and it's constantly being developed. That's what Newman's idea, if it's true, it's going to constantly be developed. You know, the Holy Spirit will keep it being developed by people doing their professional work. If it's not true, then it won't. And so what we can see, like Plat Platonism is not developed in this view. It didn't become Cartesianism. They're totally different. They're all unconnected unisex views. It's only this one of the human person. And then the second living idea is the identification of equal dignity and significant difference of a man and woman's identity in heaven through the resurrection of the body. And this is identified then with the dogma of the communion of saints. So this also has been developed phenomenally, been developed by St. Hildegard and then a, a widow named Christine de Pizan in France, Hildegard, Edith Stein, all the way through France and Poland, all these philosophers added parts to it, but it built on the same foundation. And then St. John Paul II, blew the whole thing open even bigger. He, as you can see from the very beginning, he developed on the first page ontological complementarity, biological complementarity, physical complementarity, psychological complementarity, individual complementarity, personal and spiritual in his writings. I mean, plus in the communion of persons. That's what makes the communion of persons very rich and synergetic. So in my view, philosophers and theologians are complementary. So there's something more that happens when they work together, you know, or in any, any kind of situation where you have different kinds of people together, but you have to have something you're sharing. It will be very synergetic. You experience that professionally. Something more happens if you have an, an equal dignity and you share together equality and a common goal. So that's the way I think the Lord has created us, the Lord has created the world, and it's a great joy to be part of it. Thank you. Those are good questions. I think my, I'd uh, probably give a three-part answer. The first part is I think the only way you discover that is in an actual relation. I don't think the culture determines that you can't have it. I think it's two people together that discover it. It unfolds over time. 
in a couple that wants that. Now there are other, also there's really good complementarity in friendships, you know, same-sex friendships, religious life, you know. We live in a community of women, and so you can have it without it having to necessarily be sexual and have fecundity, as you say. Now, the thing about the fecundity that is very important, Edith Stein realized that for women, ovulation is so important, and John Paul II developed that too. Every month from the time you reach puberty until menopause, basically, your body is preparing to receive a new child, you know, every month, whether or not you ever have one. So that Edith Stein and John Paul II say that's what gives women a kind of a special tendency to pay attention to the whole person. It's not a determinism, you don't have to do it, but it's a it's propensity. Whereas man generates by um, detachment of seed. It's a different kind of way of generating. So the man is also, both of them say, the man is more oriented towards out, being outside, you know, creating things, working, doing those kind of things. Now, it doesn't mean that a man can't care for the children. Obviously, they can, they do. But it's a propensity that we have that has both strengths and weaknesses. So if you look at Edith Stein or Hildegard, they talk about what the strengths are of it and what the weaknesses are of it. Okay. And John Paul II also mentions um, in Genesis, after the fall, where... Uh, God says to, to the woman, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. That for many, many centuries is interpreted as being a punishment for Eve for having led, misled Adam to, to eat the apple. But John Paul II says, no, what that is is an effect of original sin. What he means by that is that a woman has a tendency, tendency to want to cling to what she loves, keep, hold back, you know, the man's tendency is to dominate so from original sin. So they have to realize that that's their tendency. It doesn't mean it's determined they're not going to have to do that all the time, but it's a tendency they have. So it's, he opens up that whole field. Okay, this is just a big, broad picture of it. So every married couple, in effect, is with, with Christ, is working to redeem that effect of original sin with each other, with their children, with their friends if we have to be aware that we have those tendencies. So I think the thing is, is to just be yourself. <laughs> you know, each couple, you have these things going on in the culture, they're part of us, but you just have to be yourself and work out your relationship. Every couple does it themselves. How they do it is that's their gift and their, their job is to work it out. So I wouldn't despair. No, I think that's true. I think that the part of our nature is just to have certain dispositions toward things, you know. But it's like things are, they're evolving in some ways over time. Like when women weren't educated, they wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing now, give a lecture in philosophy, spend my life doing that. So, I mean, they, the, all those earlier views, well, women, have intuition, men have reason. You know, that's what I called fractional complementarity. I didn't, I didn't describe that to you. Fractional complementarity um, followed Descartes, and uh, it's because he, he only thought he had an ego. I think, therefore, I am. But we find it in almost all of those philosophers after Rousseau, Kant, um, Schopenhauer, Hegel. They're all fractional complementarity. They say um, that they have very rigid, stereo universal characteristics. You know, the man um, is universal, the woman's in the particular. That's Hegel. You know, you have Kierkegaard. I love Kierkegaard, but he was wrong on this one. You know, he says um, the, woman, the man has reason, but the woman jumps from aesthetics to, to religion. Can't go, be in the reasoning category. Or, um, 
there are a lot of different examples, you know, where you get the one half and one half, or sometimes one quarter, three quarters, and they make one person. That's the other thing that those traditions said. When you're married, they're one person. Whereas the Catholic view is no, you're two persons and you become three persons. It's, it's a different view because the Catholic has a view that you're a full person brought into relation with another full person who's complement to you. And um, I don't know if that's answering your question, but I think the tendency to universalize it doesn't work. Except in so far as you can say, most women have some periods of ovulating. Oh, which comes back to this other thing with birth control, that represses ovulation. So what it does is it represses that tendency, that experience, monthly experience that women would have. So that's a big problem for women, you know, I think. I think it just, you have, it shows. It's the kind of thing sometimes you can't, you know, you can give those general views. Um, for example, that the way we are biologically is real. It's not just having a penis or a vagina. vagina. It's, it's, a, it's more than that. You know, it's our physiology. Every cell in our body is XX or XY, generally speaking, with some exceptions. So it's not just anatomy. It's, it's the way our whole body organizes ourself, okay? And so it flows out in different ways. I'll give you another example. You watch teenage boys walk down the street, push, 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 you know, kick, kick. They can't walk neck together and talk. They're always pushing and shoving. I mean, it's fine, I think it's hysterical, but it's, you know, they haven't read any books on it. I mean, they just do it. You know, whereas girls don't do that. I mean, I've never seen girls do that. Now they might, there might be some exceptions, but they don't do that. They walk, they talk, did you see this, did you see this? You know, it's different. There's just something there. It's not, nobody makes it by the culture. So you just see that, or this, I can tell you, I've worked a lot with lay women and uh, with these principles of John Paul II, which he identifies is the, the seed of the genius of woman, is learning how to, you know, pay attention to the people in your own sphere of activity, the whole person. They like it. They say, that is what I like to do. I like to teach. I like to do this. Whereas men will say, you know, I really prefer, you know, something different. And, and they, they have to discover what it is, though. The other thing with men, generally speaking, and again, John Paul II talks about that, is they have to adopt, when they have a child, they kind of have to adopt that child and say, this is mine. I mean, they know it's theirs, they usually. But they have to make a, a will choice, a will choice. Um, Gabriel Marcel wrote about it, that whole experience of making a will choice. I will adopt this child. And once they do that, it's like St. Joseph with Mary. He was going to just leave her. He was not going to marry her. He was going to leave her. I mean, not to complete the marriage until the Holy Spirit said, no, take Mary. So he made a will choice to adopt Mary and Jesus. And then once that happened, a man tends to want to do two things, to provide for them and to protect them. Tends to, there are some who don't. But generally speaking, you'll see that in men, one way or another. So I think the key is to, to say there's more than just universal and particular. There's analogical. There are ways that, in general, with always some exceptions, and it's important to say there are always some exceptions, because with the universal, in particular, you just find one exception and your whole thing is gone. Okay? So the analogical thinking, you can say, you know, it's too bad you can't think analogically, that you can only think, you know, in these rigid universal particulars. <laughs> you know, it's a richer way, as I usually say, it's a mature way of thinking. You know, so. I, I gave a talk on this to one time in Denver, and this guy came up and said, how can I tell my football players that they can be brides of Christ? And I said, I don't know. 
you know. But you can tell them that it's a spiritual way of thinking that takes mature, great maturity to be able to, you have to make a two-way analogy. You have to say, I'm analogous to a, a bride this way, and in that sense, I'm an, I have an analogous relationship with God. Part of, is what John Paul says, so we're all part of the bride of Christ, the whole church is. The same way, we girls have to say, I'm a son in the sun. You know, I can't say, well, I can't be a son in the sun, you know, I'm a daughter, but <laughs> it's true. But I can be, because the scripture does invite us into that. It's like an invitation. You know, you say it's an invitation, maybe it's not something for you. So think a different way then. But I, I think just avoid absolute statements, but nonetheless, don't give up truth. Just use your common sense. Well, I think it's very important that we stand up and be counted just as ordinary people, not be co coward, made feel we can't say that what we think is the truth. Because as I said, an ideology always harms the innocent and it ignores the truth, the facts. So you take that whole problem of the 15 genders, people not knowing what they are, I want to be a boy, I'm in a girl's body, all that kind of stuff. They're losing their vocation. And to me, the greatest serious part is the schools where they're forced to use these things in textbooks. When children are eight years old, they're in their latent period, your best friends are same sex, always. Girls said, I hate boys, and boys, I hate girls, you know, when they're a certain age. And if they think then, at that age, you could decide who you're going to marry, and you'd marry your best friend, you know? So if they start experimenting sexually, then that starts to attach sexual pleasure to an object of the same sex. And that's where it gets really, really harmful. It harms the innocent. So I think that's the thing, is to protect the innocent. Now, we can't do everything, but we can do, this is the woman talking, things in our own sphere of activity. So in our own sphere of activity, just be very clear, very strong, very confident and not feel you have to say things, you know, you can say, look, this is your choice. I don't, it's not, I don't think it's good. I don't think it's healthy. I think it's harmful. But I mean, you look, they could be losing their vocation to marriage. They could be losing their vocation to religious life, to priesthood, to sanctity. I think you have to discover that yourself. I think in each place you have to discover what's appropriate, how to do it. Always, you know, the love of, of a child, just in terms of friendship, I think teachers have a huge influence on children. Um, just by the way you teach them, you love them, you respect them, no matter where they're coming from. And it's another example to them where you just respect them um, you have to be very careful about making any general statements. I think in the classroom now, your parents, you know, emailing and, you know, kids will be, you know, filming you. <laughs> so you have to be very careful in a public situation in schools, I think. But I think individually, it's the, where love is, is always one-on-one. -on -one. So in your relationship with the students, just affirm them. They're intelligent, affirm that. You don't have to get into whether it's boy or girl. You know, you'd make a great boy. Or, you know, we used to get that. You know, sometimes, oh, you, you want to be an engineer, you want to be like a boy or something, or you're a tomboy, we were called, you know, things like that. But I would just, just be careful about how you say things, but at the same time, be very loving to each student. 
you know, and that will mean more to them than that you care about them, you care about their work, you know, their home situation. I don't know. It's the best. The only thing you can do is be a witness. That's how I see it. That our call, and it's heroic these days, is to be a witness to the truth we have by revelation, and also I think by philosophy now. There's so much that's there in Catholic philosophers that's really strong. Pope John Paul II, I'd have to say. But you know, being an historian or philosopher, I, I love them all, and I think even with their, everybody has their mistakes, and it's, it's self-correcting over time, as I say. And I think, to me, the greatest experience of having completed this process that took me 40, over 40 years to do the three volumes, is to discover how, how the, I think it's the work of God, too, how different people contributed different things to the whole truth. You know, John Paul II has the most, but he doesn't have them all. There are other people, like, you know, Edith Stein had, had um, a lot, and also Maritain and Larg, and all these other people gave something special at that point. So the key is, what is, it, what is my God asking of me? What, what little thing can I do to add to the truth? But I, I call John Paul II the apostle of complementary, in the book, uh, gender commentary. The other thing that he did that's different from Edith Stein and Lonergan, I mean, Edith Stein and Hildegard and Jung, for example, they all said, even Teresa of Avila, that there can be masculine characteristics of a woman and feminine of a man. They all did that. John Paul II never, never, never said that. And I looked everywhere. I just couldn't believe it because he speaks Polish, so which have masculine and feminine endings and everything. He only used the word masculine for a man's way of acting in the world and feminine for a woman's way of acting in the world. Very interesting. That's why I called his view a kind of spiraling view. You know, it's not a tetrahedron <laughs> where you have all those parts, but it's it's a very interesting thing, and I, he never said why he did it, he just was clear about it. So the Catholic Church allows both. I mean, both are equally, obviously, there. But I thought to myself, when you look at what's happened now, I think that's very healthy to just do that. I never liked anyone to say I'm a masculine woman, and I don't know anyone that likes to be called a feminine man, myself. So. I think that's another way of being careful in your language. And uh, the other thing, too, is that I think what it, it shows is that there's something unique. Each person discovers how they want a, a man wants to be a man and a woman wants to be a, man, a woman. You, you work it out, you discover it. And I know that a lot of homosexuals have used that expression, I want to get in touch with my feminine side, male homosexuals, that's why they do that. And so they're thinking that that's a good way to discover something. So that's another reason why I think it's better not to use the language that way. But anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.